Hey YouTubers, it's Charlie. So yesterday during my Breaker Change video, I asked you to submit all your questions about the big WTF change to Jamie's character and all the other big moments. So I picked 10 of them to answer in this video with one bonus question. We also have to give a big high five to Teresa Harris for winning this week's giveaway. So I'll be reaching out to you on your channel for details, but you basically win a $20 Amazon gift card. If you're finding me for the first time, I'm just doing a weekly Game of Thrones giveaway just as a way to say thank you to everyone for being so awesome. So we have a lot to talk about and because you know what happened with Jamie's character was such a big deal, I think I'm gonna focus on that first. So just reminding everyone, please be nice to each other no matter what your opinion is, but yeah, it was really intense. So let's get started. Careful for spoilers from the episode if you haven't seen it yet, but here we go. Question number one, Bloody Desires asks, do you think the way Jamie was during that scene was out of character considering his development so far, considering he saved Brienne from getting raped before they cut his hand off? So yes, George R. R. Martin actually even commented on the moment himself. He basically said that because the show brought Jamie back to King's Landing earlier than normal, the whole dynamic between him and Cersei had changed. In the book version of that scene, Cersei is seeing Jamie for the first time in the crypt, and she wants him just as badly as he wants her. But on the show, because Jamie has been back for weeks, the whole context had changed, and Martin actually kind of tried to distance himself from the show, the way they portrayed it, by saying that he never talked to D&D &D about that scene. I think it's kind of unfortunate because Jamie's character is supposed to be on something of a redemptive arc. He's trying to be more like Brienne, and this scene kind of destroyed that. They do have follow-up scenes next week, which hopefully will spell out a little bit more where the show is taking Jamie this season. I think the other big question that we need to ask is, is did the show intend to do it more like the books and just mess up in the practical aspect of filming it and, you know, did the actors just change something on the day? You know, did it go down the way they intended it to? Question number two, Valentino asks, when do you think Stannis will march on the wall? So not before Davos follows up on that letter to the Iron Bank. Remember that scene where the boat passes underneath the Titan of Bravos in the trailer? I think that's Davos visiting the bank. The bank has actually become a pretty big plot point this season. Remember how the crown is in super big debt to them. Lady Elena was even talking to Tywin about it in the second episode. He kind of shrugged it off, but it sounds like Davos is going to use that to get the money from the Iron Bank. But I'm actually really interested to see if the bank becomes a much bigger part of the story going forward because promises to the bank, you know, promissory notes is in debt, has to be paid to the bank. Otherwise, they will turn around and fund your enemies. Question number three, Steve Sunny asks, why is Dorne an independent kingdom? So I actually got a whole bunch of questions about Dorne and why they have a prince but not a king and how they resisted, you know, Aegon Targaryen's conquest of Westeros. So this is kind of meant to sum up all those things. The reason that Dorne has a prince but not a king is that when Aegon Targaryen conquered Westeros, Dorne used much smarter military tactics and because of the desert and the mountains, they were able to drive the Targaryens out. Their tactics just made it so that the Targaryens couldn't use their dragons the way they needed to, like on all the other armies of Westeros. Then by the time Baylor the Blessed became king, he fixed everything. Remember, Tywin actually mentioned him when he was talking to Tommen. Baylor used a bunch of marriage packs to bring Dorne into the kingdom, but as part of that arrangement, each new ruler of Dorne got to keep the title Prince. So there's only one king of Westeros, but Dorne still has a prince, whereas all the other noble houses have lords and ladies. And remember about that marriage pact thing, Marcella is actually betrothed to one of the really young Martell princes right now. Question number four, Ceres Torres asks, who is the king now? So Tommen is the king if that wasn't clear from the episode. Until he's old enough to make political and policy decisions though, Tywin is effectively gonna be the ruler. Tommen will just be a figurehead until then. In the books, they make him sound much, much younger. The actor on the show almost looks like a teenager. He was like seven in season one, so he's supposed to be like 10 or 11 now. So they definitely aged him up a lot. In the book, all they really let Tommen do is just stamp documents like it's a game, like you would, you know, give a child finger paints. Except that he's finger painting the royal seal on like really important documents, which is just another example of like something really big that the show changed. Question number five, Danny Stones asks, do you think that Littlefinger is going to train Sansa to play the Game of Thrones? No, I don't think she's gonna become like Arya. She's not gonna become a super spy or anything. I do hope that she gets wiser and more cunning. Until now, the most common adjective used to describe her has been sweet, as in sweet Sansa. She is just kind of like a leaf being blown around by all these big forces around her, and up to now, she's really just kind of done and believed whatever anyone has told her, namely Littlefinger. So hopefully this season, we'll finally get to see some sort of Sansa badass moment or the closest thing to it. 
but if you are reading the book, she is a wins a winner POV character. So, you know, hopefully there'll be some really awesome Sansa moments then, but I'm not gonna hold my breath. Question number six, Peter Cho asks, why are the cannibals traveling with Egret's group? So the Thens are just part of the raiding party that's trying to open that gate at Castle Black. It can only be opened from the other side of the wall, so Mance Raider can't bring his army through until it's opened, and the Wildlings can't open it until they eat through a lot of crow. In the book, the Thens weren't really cannibals, but another tribe was. But since there are so many tribes of Wildlings, the show just had to kind of condense a lot of that stuff. I actually think that for one of my future bonus videos, I'm gonna do something just for all the different tribes of the Wildlings. There's so many of them that you kind of have to give them their own video. Question number seven, Casey asks, do you think that Tywin is taking Tommen under his wing because he doesn't want another Joffrey situation? So I definitely think he's aware that Tommen is open to suggestion. Remember how he went straight to marriage and heirs. He's all about the Lannister bloodline and duty to family, mostly that the line continues. Instead of the birds and the bees, you know, with him, it's more like the business in the bees. I don't think that Tywin is necessarily evil. I think he's more like a grumpy Vulcan. He has like this really clear vision for what he wants his family to be and how he thinks that the kingdom figures into that. And now that Tommen is king, he's found himself in a situation where not a lot of people are gonna be causing him problems. The big issue with Joffrey was is that he just made a lot of decisions without consulting Tywin or he just flat out did the opposite. The first really good example of that is whenever Joffrey beheaded Ned Stark. Tywin totally would not have done that. It's actually kind of what started the War of the Five Kings. Question number eight, Chad Morton asks, why does Alistair Thorne hate Jon Snow? Mostly because he's a very petty small man. Whenever Jon first came to the watch, Alistair, you know, who was master at arms, just mocked him by calling him Lord Snow and making fun of the fact that he was a highborn bastard who'd ended up at the Night's Watch, which is kind of like the ultimate chain gang of Westeros. And eventually Jon Snow made fun of him back and that's when Alistair started just to outright hate him. You know, bullies do not like to be bullied themselves. It's not a very good reason to hate someone, but the book version of the character is a very petty person. Question number nine, Gaz2D2 asks, do you think Game of Thrones will feature any flashbacks? So I assume you're talking about flashbacks to the past, the history of Westeros. Yes, I think Bran will actually see some whenever he finally meets the Three-Eyed Raven. He'll probably tell Bran his story, you know, how he came to be where he is. So they'll have to show something from his past it just seems too cool not to, especially with that dream sequence they did whenever Bran warged with the tree. Actually, the next bonus video I'm doing, the bonus video for next Sunday before episode 4, is going to be all about the Blood Raven. That was actually the Three-Eyed Raven's name back when he was in Westeros, so that'll cover a lot of his history in great detail. But I won't be talking about any of the stuff that's going to happen in the future on the show. Question number 10, Martin asks, Do you feel the Hound has become more docile since teaming up with Arya? So I definitely think that Arya is rubbing off on him and that whenever he senses it, he just tries to shake it off as much as he can. Like when they were taken in by the farmer, he played along and you could see that he thought about staying to help them. But then in the morning, his own sense of self-loathing just rises up and he shakes off all the niceness and just robs the hell out of him. I think that he hates himself so much that whenever anyone treats him with any kind of kindness, he either doesn't believe them or he treats it with hatred. I really do think that Arya is getting tired of him though, so I wonder how much longer it's going to continue. They have kind of a temporary truce that's been going on because Arya knows that the Hound can help her and the Hound knows that she's worth money to someone. And one last bonus question, Side Effect asks, how big of a role will Mark Gatiss have? So I don't think it's going to be Mycroft big if that's what you're wondering. He's playing someone who works for the Iron Bank of Bravos. I haven't seen him on the show yet, so I think we will see him when we do travel to Bravos. Davos is going to have to borrow a ton of money to get Stannis that army, so eventually we will see that place. There was actually a pretty cool shout out for the gold company, so he might actually be using that money to hire them as a mercenary army. Which actually reminds me, even if the show doesn't end up going down that route, I'm planning on doing bonus videos for the Golden Company and the Second Sons, because both those mercenary groups have really interesting histories. So thank you so much for submitting questions. These are always a lot of fun to do. I'm sure the Jamie debate is going to continue to go on. I think we'll get some more answers whenever the next episode airs. But remember, my next bonus video is going to be about the Blood Raven. Be sure to subscribe to get it and feel free to leave me suggestions for other bonus videos in the comments below. So right now, click here to get my bonus video for the history of Marine and Slaver's Bay and click here to get my review of the episode. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys tomorrow. High fives.